let me deal with the second dimension of this contrarian gospel that is very important jesus also taught us that true wisdom lay in doing what is right rather than merely paying lip service without corresponding action or making the necessary sacrifice the apostle paul i know that shego debami was here earlier i don't know if he's still around but shego was here for sure and spoke the apostle paul used an analogy from sports to illustrate the important principle of self-sacrifice and doing rather than merely talking because there's a lot of talking going on but not enough doing Paul pointed out that those who succeed in sports discipline their bodies and go through grueling practice in order to emerge victorious this is the Olympic mindset which I define as being world-class and globally competitive accepting personal responsibility for reaching your highest potential defying defeat and succeeding without making excuses that is the olympic mindset and everybody that goes to the olympics knows that's the only way you make it we need to operate with an olympic mindset in all our dealings knowing that we are in competition with the rest of the world there is global competition for talent even nigerian people there's global competition for them nigerians in diaspora are doing very well there's global competition for capital there's global competition for investment even nigerians have a choice where they invest the world does not owe us anything one of the most troubling terms we use when people operate in mediocrity or do things that are not right in Nigeria is that this is Nigeria, as if that's okay since this is Nigeria. Oh no, water does not run uphill in Nigeria. If we operate in mediocrity, we will only have mediocrity to show for our efforts. We need to stop using the term, this is Nigeria, to mean or to describe things that are inferior behavior, as if Nigerians are their lot. It's not our lot. As we say in our faith, we reject it. You know? <laughs> A country like Singapore emerged and became one of the most prosperous countries from a very difficult history. You people know the story of Singapore. It emerged and became one of the most pro prosperous countries in the world under the visionary leadership of Lee Kuan Yew, who also was part of a tribe. They also had a tribe that made a decision, just like we must make in this generation, to build the Singapore of their dreams. When nations obey the principles that lead to abundance, they prosper. Conversely, the opposite is also true. When nations do the opposite, even if they call on God's name in vain, they suffer lack and poverty. You know, this reminds me of one of the parables of Jesus that some of us might know. The parable of the two sons, told by Jesus in Matthew 21, verses 28 to 31. And here goes the parable. But what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and walk in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. But later, he thought about it, changed his mind, and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, yes, I'll go. But he didn't go. Which of them obeyed his father? They replied, the first son. In some respects, you can liken some societies like Singapore. Like the, you can liken them to the first son in the sense that they follow and obey the principles that the Bible and God teaches. And those, these are the principles that lead to prosperity, even though they're broadly speaking, they're not considered religious societies. Just like us, they're multi-ethnic. In our country, however, broadly speaking, we are mostly religious, but we have not followed the principles. We have not done what the faith says that leads to genuine prosperity. To put it even more bluntly, we have made fundamental errors. We have believed in a lie. As if by following the wrong values, we can follow them, and by saying the right things or sort of saying it's not my fault, we can get the right results. As the Bible says, God is not mocked. What you sow is what you reap. You know, so in fact, in some respects, people that are wise, they look at the results to know what they sowed, in case you are confused, in case you've forgotten. Let me give you another quote to illustrate that. Let me give you another quote. Since you are interested in it, let me give you another quote. One of the interesting people I read, he's a devotional writer, Bob Grass. He says, listen to this, he says, we don't reap when we sow. We may not reap where we sow, but we always reap what we sow. Therefore, sow what you need. We don't reap when we sow. We may not reap where we sow but we always reap what we sow therefore 
so what you need. If you need love, so love. Why give people hate and expect love back? If you want people to respect you, respect them. Why disrespect people and say they're not respecting me? We must change this and go back to the principles that underpin prosperity, which are the same principles His Excellency the Vice President pointed out in his speech on a new tribe. Integrity, hard work that produces excellence. I don't want to give too many quotes. Each time I, when I said hard work, I remember Aristotle. You know, excellence is what we do. You know, it's not an act or something. It's not an event. It's what you do. It's what you repeatedly do that is excellence. So hard work produces excellence. Justice and love of country. Those are the qualities that will build the nation we want. Ladies and gentlemen, principles are universal and are always at work, whether we acknowledge them or not. In his very seminal and influential book, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey said, Principles are rules or laws that are permanent. Principles are rules or laws that are permanent, unchanging and universal in nature. We must build the Nigeria of our dreams on the set of principles that underpin genuine and lasting prosperity, such as integrity, hard work and excellence, justice and love of country. Let me now begin to conclude by summarizing the lessons I've shared with us today. First of all, we must start with the end in mind. What is the country we want? What do we want so that we know what to sow? We need a vision for Nigeria which builds a great nation, brings success, and produces a good life for all our people. That's what we want. Then next, I have shared with us three key steps for implementation, for getting things done and producing the good results we so desperately need. First, we must create the environment for all to succeed. It has been said that when Nigerians live here, they succeed. But when you give them high hurdles to jump in Nigeria, unfortunately, many people will fail the high jump. Government at all levels, the private sector, and even civil society must accept responsibility and partner to create the enabling environment. Notice that this is about collective partnership, working together. It's not about finger pointing. As important as government is, it cannot create the enabling environment alone. But a major part of the enabling environment is what we do for each other in our communities, in our societies, in our churches, in our homes, in our workplaces. Second, the second lesson I shared with us for building this great society of ours is to inspire and foster a committed generation armed and dedicated to build the Nigeria of our dreams. And I'm proposing that we be the Nigerian, we be the, that generation, we be that new tribe that will do it. Let's not pass it on. Let's not kick the ball further afield. Third and finally, we must follow the contrarian principle of always doing the right thing first and not being unduly influenced by popularity or wanting to be praised by men. What do you need the praises of men for? Dare to be contrarian and wise enough to be right on what actually works as opposed to what people want to hear. Let me now close by speaking briefly on a subject that is very dear to my heart. And this is just my own way of accepting responsibility, having shared this with us. You know, I was asked to join the government a little under, a little, um, under two years ago, November 2015. You know, and for me, I accept that this is an, an important opportunity, even a unique opportunity. And I must make the most of the opportunity I've been given to serve my country. You know, I, I don't want to end up when I'm done saying what just happened. It just, the time just, you know, breezed away. And before I know it, the, the, the tenor is over. I know that ultimately promotion comes from God. And I must not squander the grace of God. And I would add, we must not squander the grace of God. I know many of us here are also in positions of responsibility. We must master and make the most of the opportunity God has given us to serve our nation. You know, because it's one thing to be on the other side and be saying what they ought to do. It's another thing when you are invited to join the government. You know, then you must say, what must I do to be a blessing to my nation and to my people? And we must not squander the opportunity God has given us. David said, is it a light thing to marry the king's daughter? You know the story. First Samuel chapter 18, they came to him and said, oh, the king is thinking you might marry the daughter. And they, were, and they were trying to trick him, but he said, what? Don't you understand how big a deal it is? It's not a small thing to be asked to serve your country. So I don't take it for granted at all. You know, we must make the most of the opportunity we've been given by God to serve this nation. We must. Jesus in the Bible admonishes us to work while it is day. 
For Jesus himself says, the night is coming when no one can walk. It has been said that the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of the opportunity. Every opportunity has an expiry date. We have the responsibility to make the most of the opportunities we have been given to serve our nation and build the Nigeria of our dreams. And the job starts now. Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Then he concludes by saying, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. You know, so, as I conclude, I just want to serve in a way, when it's all over, because I know that it's definitely going to be all over sooner rather than later. I can honestly say to myself and others that I gave it my all. I worked hard. I poured my life into it. The grace bestowed upon me by God was not squandered. And I gave it my all. I want to serve with the motto, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. Like Paul, when it's all over, I want to be able to say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. And I want to invite all of us here today to adopt this same mindset. That's what will build in Nigeria. We can build Nigeria for ourselves and our posterity. We can, but we must accept the responsibility now. I invite all of us here today to adopt this same mindset as we run this race together to build the Nigeria of our dreams. At the end of our race, may our Father in heaven say to us, well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful in all these things. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you.